Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another lecture on sound design. Here we go. And this one, we're going to be introducing some more web audio API functionality. So I'm still doing quite basic or essential functionality, but this is actually quite awkward and tricky because we need to use, um, we need to make calls outside of the web audio API using various other APIs. And it's also tricky because we're dealing with files where um, the file loading happens in a different thread than all of the web audio API functionality. So that's the main reason why a lot of uh, what we're dealing with, with files, recording files and loading files is quite um, awkward code, but we'll try and make it as simple as possible. So here goes. First, um, there's already some audio functionality that exists without the web audio API, just in HTML and JavaScript. And it comes from the audio element. It's what has been available for decades, really, for someone to put some audio onto a web page. So the audio element, as it looks in HTML, simply embeds uh, a sound file onto a web page. Whenever it's done and you see the controls, it looks like one of what's shown. The, uh, the top one probably being the most popular, the sort of standard default format in Chrome but it can look like any of these. The controls, by the way, which may be hidden or, or shown to some extent, are what's known as transport controls. Rewind, fast forward, pause, play, stop, that sort of thing. And it's quite a nice element because it has built-in buffering and streaming support. You don't have to worry about how the file is loaded. You just play it. It's ideal for lot linear media, like playing back a piece of music. But you don't get very precise timing controls. There's limits on the number of sounds that can be played at once. You can't guarantee the, pre the pre-buffering of a sound, and this is important. If, say, the whole of the sound file hasn't loaded properly, it might start playing and then have to pause. You don't know that the file has all entirely been loaded. And just as important for use in sound design or anything like that, there's no ability to apply real-time effects. It just plays the sound. If you, if you want the sound to be distorted, then that distortion needs to be done beforehand and is not really controlled by the user. And there's no way to analyze the sound. So for all of these reasons, if one just wants to play sound, the audio element is not sufficient. We really want to get those sounds into the web audio API where we can use all the functionality that's already there. So to work with those audio elements, we use what's known as the Media Element Audio Source Node. Quite a long and awkward name, but what it basically does is it wraps around an audio tag, or similarly, a video tag, as long as the video tag has an audio stream to it. So within the Web Audio API, we can't do anything with video content that doesn't have a soundtrack to go along with it. But if there's a soundtrack, in the video, we can use that just like a standard audio stream. The node itself behaves like other source nodes. It's not really that different from the others, just the content that is the source comes from this audio element. And the rendered audio can now be rerouted. You can sum it with something else. You can apply various effects to it. You can change the spatial position and everything that we will learn about that can be done uh, in the web audio API. So what else do we need to say? Uh, it's no longer heard directly as an HTML media element. Instead, it's heard as a consequence of this media element audio source node being connected through the audio graph. But the other media elements are still unchanged. You can still press pause or change the volume on the audio control as usual. So. Let's look at a simple example. This is again like the hello world. We're just creating an oscillator. 
one of the simplest examples of doing something interesting that could be done. It's really an alternative hello world rather than just play a wave. Let's just play a file. So we use the audio control. That's all HTML. We could have done this other ways. We could have used a video control. We could have also done it entirely in JavaScript with the audio constructor, which is a method audio uh, as shown. Now, that way you don't show the controls. So it's quite nice. The audio can be dealt with under the hood, but you could just take out this controls here in the audio element and that does the same thing. Note also that the number of output channels from the node equals the number of channels in the audio. What this means is if the file we're dealing with, in this case, viper.mp3, if that was in stereo, then this creates um, a stereo output from the node to use in the audio graph. One other point to note about the media element source, it's not a scheduled source node. You don't need uh, a start method for it to start playing. The start is usually controlled by the audio element itself. So before moving on, Let's let's try this out. Let's have a listen. Um just make this big for you. So here it is. Uh same code, maybe only some slight differences here between um what was shown in the slides. Uh we have an audio element. The ID that we give it is file because we're going to use the audio from this audio element, this file, for the media element source. And also note, I didn't do a new media audio element source. I use the alternative create media element source shown here. We define our audio context. We create this source node. We connect the source to a gain node, connect from the gain node then to the destination. That's it. Let's see how this looks. So. And hopefully it will play. So you should have all heard that. Um, the sound might be a little distorted, as is often the case when uh, recording a video while playing back the sound. But you should he have heard just the WAV file being played. Nothing special going on there. What about buffers. So maybe we want to load some audio into a buffer. So just the data of the audio, the samples per second, and manipulate it. Now, that audio could come from a sample, or it could be something that we create ourselves. So it's just a stream of numbers that we create, and we want to treat it the same way we would treat audio coming from the uh, media element source node that was just shown. So we can do that with the audio buffer source node. And there's actually two methods to look at here. There's the, there's the audio buffer source node or the create buffer source. And there's also the audio buffer. These are two different things. The audio buffer stores multiple audio channels. It can be used, if you notice here, this new audio buffer options, we do not specify the context on that line. So it can be used by multiple contexts. It just exists regardless of the audio graph. And all it does is it stores audio channels, one or two or many, as arrays of floating point numbers. The important parameters, if you call it uh, create buffer this way, you need to specify the number of channels, the length or uh, 
the length in terms of samples, which gives you the duration once you know the sample rate, the number of samples per second. Then, very easily, you can create a buffer source node using that audio buffer. So you store the buffer in the audio buffer source node, and then that acts like a node, just like all the other nodes. This is a scheduled source, so it will need storing. So how does that look in terms of our code? It is shown here. We have a button. So first, this short file, um, we're going to create some noise and store that in a buffer. That way, we can loop it and we have a noise source. It's one of the many ways to create a noise source and we'll discuss some of the other ways uh, later on in different lectures. So here, um, we have a button to start. We uh, resume the context when that is done because remember that the um, to start an audio context, you need some user interaction. We call that button make noise. And then in terms of the JavaScript code, we define a few variables, i and channel. In this version, I'm gonna make a small change because we don't actually use the channel variable here. So we uh, define variables, we create a new context, we create the buffer source. So that was doing it this way rather than new audio buffer source node. And um, we set the buffer for this buffer source based on creates the buffer and here we specify it only has one channel, so it's mono, it's not stereo, not surround sound. So it's just gonna be one array of numbers, and it will have 1,024 numbers at whatever is the sample rate. So it's quite a short sample here. And then we state that we will fill the array, and this is how it's going to be filled. There's another method for the source buffer, which is get channel data. And get channel data allows us to set the data within that channel to whatever we want it set to. Here, we're setting it to two times a random number minus one. Now, the JavaScript uh, method math.random generates every time it's called a random number between zero and one. But our audio is represented between minus one and one. So to take those numbers between zero and one and turn them into uh, values that we can use for audio, what we do is we multiply it by two. Now instead of zero to one, it's zero to two, and subtract one, which makes it ranging from minus one to one, which is the range for our audio data. Then we store our source and we connect it to the destination. So let's see what this will do right here. And I'm probably going to play around with it a little bit. So first I need to find the code where I have an audio buffer. And let's see. And there it is. Now it did start automatically, but if I had been running this remotely, you would definitely need to click the make noise button. So one thing to show you is right here. Yes, so here, oh, what that would have been if I had used exactly the code shown on the slide, is a very, very short sample. Only 1,024 individual samples at a sampling rate of 44,100 or 48,000, whatever is the sample rate on the machine. And so it would have been a small fraction of a second. But the code that I actually ran here um, has a duration of three 
times the sample rate. So it generated three seconds of sound. But that's it for creating buffered audio. And now, it starts to get a little bit trickier. How do we load an audio sample? So loading a sample is not directly built into the web audio API, but loading media content or um, loading data can be done with what's known as the XML HTTP request. That is what is done here. We, um, we have a new one of these XML HTTP requests. We call it open with getting, and here's our audio file, the same one we just used before, viper.mp3. We say that the response when we load it, or when we request it, is going to be an array buffer. So we're going to try and turn that into data that we can work with. When it it's fully loaded, then we're going to try to decode that audio data. And decode audio data is part of the web audio API. Basically, it takes the results of this XML request. And from that generates a buffer of data, which we then specify that that buffer is going to be the buffer used by the source node. And we have one more um, aspect to mention here. When we load in an audio sample, or more to the point, when we have a buffer source, we can change its playback rate and other parameters. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But at the moment, just note that we have created one slider to change the playback rate value for this node. So let's see. Now, when you change the playback rate, you're actually changing the pitch of sound. This is how the Doppler effect works. The idea that when a source is moving towards you, you hear it higher in pitch. When it's moving away from you, you hear it lower in pitch. So think of this, sound samples are coming at you over time. And if you're stationary and the source is stationary, you get those sound samples with just some fixed delay after they were emitted, but at the same rate. But now suppose that source is coming towards you very fast. So you get a sound sample. You should get the next sound sample, um, whatever is the period between sam sound samples later. But instead, the source has moved closer to you and then emits the sound sample at its normal time, but it's caught up with the previous sound sample. So those sound samples end up bunched together. What that means is that the period has become shorter. The period between waves, uh, the periods of sine waves has become less. So less period means higher frequency. When a source moves towards you, you hear it higher in pitch. That's what happens with changing the playback rate. With audio put into a buffer, you can also loop it you can change the loop positions, you, and you're basically working with samples the way musicians and composers would work with samples when they're sampling music, especially for things like EDM, electronic dance music, or many modern musical genres. So what happens to the samples? Let's give an example here. You can have audio in a buffer, and you can select 
when you will start to play that audio, with, which sample or which ta what time within the buffer you will select, when you will end playing a sample. So you can chop a, out a little segment from that buffered audio and choose to play it faster or slower. And here we're doing that. You can also specify um, from your loop or from your buffer a offset where you will start playing it. And there you go. So this is how it might look. We have audio in the buffer. We select the this area that is red. We're going to play it out at a much slower rate, 0 0.25. So we interpolate the positions between known samples to play that out. So that's the way the audio buffer works. Now, finally, we move on to recording. For recording an audio node, one uses the node called Media Stream Audio Destination, another long name, and also use that in conjunction with the Media Recorder, which is part of a different API, the Media Stream Recording API. So the media recorder allows you just to record any sound or, or video. The media stream audio destination specifically routes audio from its input node to a media stream as output. So this is an, an output or a destination node. And here's the code, and I'll jump back and talk about the last point in a minute, but if you look at the code, the tricky bits are down here. So we have a recorder, which is just a new media recorder. We have a destination, which is our media stream destination. That's all fine and dandy. But then for the recorder, there's certain things that can happen. Data becomes available or it stops recording. It's um, we have for some reason specified to stop it. So um, recorder start, that's an easy one, start recording. Recorder stop, that's an easy one, stop recording. But then we need to specify what happens whenever there is data available, what happens when we stop. Now the data comes in in chunks. So every say 1,024 samples, we've got a bunch of data, what do we do with it? This allows us to record without um, having to pause everything. It happens in intervals throughout. So on data available, every time we get a new bit of data, we push that into some array and uh, event array we're, we're calling it. Doesn't, doesn't really matter, but we push it into an array of data. Um, so all of every time there's an event, meaning, hey, there's more data, let's push that to the chunks array. Then when we click stop, we've got enough chunks. So what we do is we call um, another function, blob, capital blob. And blob is something that creates a file-like object of raw data. So essentially it turns all this array into a file. And here we've done it in an audio format, OGG, which is a sort of open standard one for audio on the web. A fairly new one, but uh, quite usable for some purposes. And this is all part of the create object URL method, which takes this blob, um, that method is designed for use with blobs, takes this blob of raw audio and makes it a URL that can be selected, can be downloaded from, you can work with. So, Let's have a look and then we'll uh, discuss the one problem with this. So, start recording audio, stop recording audio. We can play out that audio. Now, 
this file here. I hope it was in the, the slide I was looking at. Yes, all I've done is create a pure tone for us to um, listen to. The tone wasn't connected to the, um, the standard destination, so we didn't hear it play out. We just started it and generated it, but all we connected it to was um, this media stream. But we can now download it. It's a file, we can download it, we can work with it, and there it is. But I don't like using this. It's fairly simple, and the reason I don't like using it is because what other file formats the media recorder can work with it's whatever file formats generally we have for, um, well, well it's, it's not all of the file formats that an audio element can support. It's quite limited. The main one that it doesn't support is WAV, W-A-V files. And that is by far the most popular format for uncompressed audio files. So every audio analyzer, every player, um, every visualizer, generally can work with WAV files, but we can't get that this way. And it's also a little bit clunky here, but that's okay. An alternative is to use some third party package, something that other people have built for use with the Web Audio API, which has nice functionality for recording audio as a WAV file. And so I'm not going to discuss that in detail here. I'll just show you a little bit of what it looks like when you work with it. So first you would need to um, have the recorder.js file, and that's big and ugly, but you, you don't change it. You just um, have that where it can be seen. So then once you have that file, you would need here it is. So just going to fix a little formatting to make that more readable. Okay, so we load that in using the script here. And then we define our new recorder from recorder JS. And we specify it's going to record the tone. And then the only places we use it are recorder.record recorder stop recording, and recorder export a WAV file. And that's it. So that's it. You now know enough to um, load audio and just play it straight out. And to create buffers, so you can create the audio that you would work with or um, modify the playback rate or loop it. And using that buffer and a bit more functionality, functionality, you can record the audio as well. This is essential if you're going to be working with the Web Audio API a lot because at some point you're going to need to analyze the audio that you've created and test it and maybe share recordings of it with others and so forth. Okay, that concludes this video lecture. As always, please let me know if you have any comments and thank you very much.